Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the course entitled Integrated Pest Management for the Landscape Manager. This course is going to introduce you to IPM and how you can implement it into your turf care or your horticulture business and try to reduce um, the use of pesticides. Now, don't get me wrong, I love pesticides. I truly believe that we cannot feed the world if it was not for pesticides. And it would be impossible to get rid of crabgrass, weeds in the turf, things of that nature. So pesticides, yes, will still need to be used. What IPM does is just try to use other tactics and procedures that may help reduce the use of pesticides and, and use some other means. Hopefully you've watched my course entitled Natural Pest Controls. That was a good intro for this and kind of leads you into this. If not, it's okay to watch this one first, but uh, let's go ahead and get started with Integrated Pest Management or abbreviated IPM for the last Landscape Manager. And so what is a pest? A pest is any destructive or troublesome insect, animal, weed, or microorganism or pathogen. So that's, that's a lot right there. But if you've seen Natural Pest Controls, my lecture uh, on that topic, a pest may be a pest in certain situations and not others. And I gave a great example of Bermuda grass. Now, if I'm on a golf course, Bermuda grass is not a weed. It is a beautiful grass when you are playing golf. Or if you're lounging around a swimming pool uh, down by the coast and they've got turf grass around it, it's going to be a warm season grass and more than likely it's Bermuda. And if you're taking your kids to ball practice, soccer practice, baseball practice, you're probably playing on Bermuda grass, especially around here in the triad. We are in the uh, transition zone, so we do see some warm season grasses, mainly mainly we see cool season grasses, but we do have some clients that have warm season grasses. But that Bermuda grass on an athletic field is not a pest, but in my tall fescue lawn, it is considered a pest. So great example on when uh, a plant or an animal may be a pest in certain situations and not the other. And there are four major types of pests. We have weeds, our money maker in the lawn care industry. I uh, love these dandelions. They make us money, just like crabgrass. Disease agents or pathogens, we make money spraying for brown patch and, and other types of diseases that may affect our plant materials. Invertebrates or our insects, some cool little guys. The world of entomology is a cool, cool subject. Um, love studying insects, but uh, you know some of these insects can be beneficial at times, and other times they are a pest. And then we have our vertebrates. We have our little mouse guy here, and how anybody could say that this guy is a pest. Is he not the cutest little thing? I am just kidding, ladies and gentlemen. But um, vertebrates or, you know, animals with backbones, vertebrate biology was one of the coolest courses I ever took in graduate school. Uh, took it at Clemson University, great, great class, and learned a lot about animals with backbones and the development of those animals. And so... Um, Cool subject matter. But these are our ty four types. Doubtfully, we're going to mess with anything uh, with a backbone in uh, in our world, in our horticulture professions. That's going to be left up to the structural guys. Uh, but every now and then, we may run across one. Pest differences. You have continuous pests, you have sporadic pests, and you have potential. Continuous, nearly always present and requires regular control. Yeah, we're going to have some weeds pop up, clover. So I'd say that's kind of continuous, uh, especially uh, on a turf grass that does not have a lawn care program um, for it. Sporadic, migratory, silical, or other occasional pests that require control once in a while. Maybe brown patch, something like that. You know, depends on the, the weather and when our customers are running their irrigation system. So that can sporadically happen. And then potential, not pests under normal conditions, but can require control under certain circumstances. Again, Bermuda grass, great example for a potential pest. So what is a pesticide? A pesticide is any substance that is used to kill a pest or prevent or reduce the damage it may cause. And here we have three all-purpose 
Uh, well, not all purpose. That miracle grows in all purpose plant food. Maybe that's why I said it. But we have our typical uh, type pesticides that we can get at the big box stores. Roundup, you know, it is a non selective herbicide that's going to kill pretty much anything that is growing. Uh, then we have our fertilizer here, miracle grow. And then we have ortho. Uh, home Defense Max, an insecticide that's going to actually kill bugs inside and keep them out. Sets that barrier for them. All three of these can be gotten at the big box stores. You do not need a pesticide license to purchase them. You would only need a pesticide to purchase a restricted use pesticide, which you will not find at any of the big box stores here. You're going to have actually go to one of the uh, landscape supply houses to purchase that, and you would have to uh, show them that you are a licensed pesticide applicator to purchase a RUP or restricted use pesticide. Here we have uh, some pest management goals and terminology. Our goals of pest management is to prevent or keep pest problems from occurring. Our pre-emergent herbicide that we do uh, every uh, late winter, early spring for, for crabgrass. Suppression, reduced pest populations to acceptable levels. Um, a lot of times with our insects, we're trying to, to do that. We don't want to get rid of every single insect because you may run uh, their natural predators away if there's no food. Again, the, the goal of pest management or integrated pest management is to bring it down to an acceptable level. Eradication, eliminate the pest pro, uh, population. So I look at this more as our broadleaf weeds. Let's get rid of the weeds and the turf. And then some terms that we should know, mode of action, how a pesticide works, whether it's a poison, repellent, desiccant, etc. Selectivity, pesticides may affect many organisms or only a single targeted species. Uh, so non-selective herbicide is going to get rid of everything, including your turf grass and your weeds. Uh, if you used a selective herbicide for, for clover or broadleaf, it will not harm your turf grass. And this is, guys, a review for most of you. Systemic, some pesticides enter the tissues of the pest, crop, or animal, and are transported within. Contact, some pesticides do not translocate within the pest plant or the animal. And so um, the pesticide may kill on contact. It doesn't have to transport or translocate through the, the animal or the plant material. Residual activity, the effective lifetime of different pesticides varies from hours to weeks, months, and years. And then pesticide resistance, when pest population is no longer controlled by a pesticide, usually due to elimination of susceptible individuals by repeated exposure. And so a lot of insects will build up uh, resistance to certain pesticides, and that's why you've got to alternate your pesticides uh, within your uh, treatment plans. Types of pesticide, guys, a lot of this is review, all the way from an herbicide for weeds, insecticide for insects, fungicide, rodenticide, all the way down to repellent, defoliant, desiccant, growth regulator. Guys, I love plant growth regulators. That has helped out a lot in commercial landscape maintenance, that when you can prune your dwarf Burford hollies that are in abundance on your uh, property. I'd almost consider them a pest so, sometimes, just kidding. Um, but you can prune your dwarf Burford hollies and when they get that, that light tint green new growth spurt, you can go back and hit it with uh, a plant growth regulator and, and help you reduce your pruning uh, throughout the growing season. And then pheromones, chemicals that affect behavior of other members of the same species. For example, moths use pheromones to attract mates. Pheromones are commonly used to attract insects to a trap. Maybe, maybe it's the cologne that men wear to try to attract women on their dates. Maybe. Only kidding, ladies and gents. But what is IPM? I have two similar definitions that I found in two different textbooks. The first one, integrated pest management, or IPM, is the coordinated use of appropriated control tactics used to reduce pests and their damage to an acceptable level. Remember that acceptable level term. Secondly, the combination of appropriate pest control tactics into a single plan to reduce pests and their damage to an acceptable level. So, two very, very similar definitions from two different textbooks. But remember, it is a combination of different tactics into one plan that is going to reduce pests 
and or their damage to an acceptable level. It does not say anything about total eradication, does it? Again, we don't want to necessarily get rid of the all of the pests because you get rid of all of the pests, then you get rid of the, the beneficial predators that may be feeding on these pests, and then those pests can return and have a life cycle that just, boom, there's more of them. We've ran off all the natural predators. What are we going to do? So, again, good information there, guys. So, components of the IPM. The IPM approach can be grouped into six major steps. First, identify the pest and understand its biology. Here's the problem. A lot of horticulture professionals and landscape managers out there in the industry today have a hard time identifying the pest. I know individuals that's been in the business 20 plus years and still can't identify plant material. If they don't understand and can identify the plant materials that we're using every day, I'm pretty sure they don't know the pest and definitely the biology of the pest that may be associated with certain plant materials that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So study it, know your plant material and know your weeds, know your disease and know your insects, guys. This is, this is a major part of being uh, a, a horticulture profession or professional. Second, you want to monitor the pest to be managed. Well, you got to identify it first and then be able to monitor it. And when you're monitoring it, you need to uh, keep track of it. You need to document on what you're seeing. Third, determine if the threshold levels of pest populations have been reached. Now, thresholds are going to be different for different people. You may have a client that would fire you in a heartbeat because you have one little patch of clover pop up in their yard. You may have a client next door to this client that doesn't care if they have any weeds or doesn't care if they have the whole yard's weeds. They just don't care. People's thresholds are different. Some people are okay with seeing some bugs. Other people, just the sure sight of the insect is going to want them to go run to the big box stores and buy every insecticide on the shelf. They freak out over it. You've got to determine what your threshold is and see what it is for your clients. Fourth, consider various management choices that you may have. Not all pests require the use of a pesticide. There may be other ways that we can handle this pest. Fifth, implement the tactic or tactics that control the pest with the least harm to everything else, including the environment, including the dog that's going to be outside, the children that's going to be on the grass playing. We want to protect the environment and protect the home and family. And then six, record and evaluate your results. Hey, what works? When did you see it? What did you do? What time of year? What time of day? What was the temperature? Everything. And guys, we can get all that information on our phones. I mean, where else in the world? I, 20 years ago, if I wanted to get find out where north was, I had to take a compass. Now I can use my phone. If I want to see what the temperature is outside, I can check Snapchat, the app on my phone. It's amazing what all this can do. You can get a exact temperature reading from your phone using the uh, Snapchat app. So um, write all this stuff down. Keep a notebook or better yet, type it up in your phone. You can email it to yourself, but you need to know what's happening when you are introducing and implementing an integrated pest management plan for a client. Overview of integrated pest management. Again, Pest identification, the most critical factor in successful pest control. We need to monitor and scout, finding the pest and taking samples to estimate their populations. So um, always keep a good eye out. Take a sample back to the shop. If you don't know what it is, guys, take a picture of it. Actually get one of them. Take back to your office. See what you can find. See what it is. Action thresholds or economic thresholds, a little different but determine whether a pest population is likely to cause enough damage to justify the cost of control. Sometimes it may be more costly to apply the pesticide than to just let the, the pest have the, the, the plant materials that they've already infected. It's going to cost you more money to apply the pesticide. So um, select the best management option or combination of options for achieving the goal. So natural control measures of forces. Again, if you'd seen my lecture on natural pest controls, we talked about that. Predators, pathogens, parasites, changes in weather, peritosoids, 
all kinds of stuff. Are we just able to eliminate the food? That could be a natural pest control. Cultural control, crop or site management strategies that reduce pest numbers or damage. Sanitation, remove the food, water or shelter. Mechanical control, cultivate, disc, mow, remove by hand. Again, we have that client that doesn't want Roundup spread, so we're hand pulling our weeds, and they're paying us a, a healthy hourly rate for that. Exclusion, screens, traps, barriers, biological control, introduction of predators or pathogens, host resistance, naturally occurring or biologically engineered, quarantine or regulatory control for pests occurring over a large area or endangering public health, government agencies may take action. One of my favorite movies of all time was Quarantine. Again, I love, love um, uh, infectious disease stuff, guys. So this is the closest thing to it. Chemical control, use of pesticides to kill, repel, regulate, attract, or otherwise interrupt the pest life or life cycle. And then evaluate and record the results. Post-treatment monitoring to estimate pest population is important for measuring effectiveness of pest control actions and keep records of results. Again, document, document, document. And if you know me with social media, I like doing that. That is one way to do it. Everything that we could need to have for implementing an integrated pest management plan when it comes to documenting and recording is on our new and improved cell phones from back when I first got into the business. So for a pesticide application to make economic sense or at least break in even, you must monitor the pest population to see if it has reached the economic threshold when the cost of treatment can be justified to keep it from reaching the economic injury level. Now, just take a look at this chart. It is the number of pests over time. And so that economic threshold, that's when we need to treat. If it gets over that economic injury level, it's going to cost way too much to apply the pesticide. You're probably going to lose the crop anyway. But in between that economic threshold and economic injury level is the time to treat. That's when it is going uh, to best benefit you to apply a pesticide at that moment and that time. All right, control strategies. We have natural controls. Love some natural pest controls. We have applied controls, whether it be biological, mechanical, and exclusion, cultural, physical environmental modification, genetic control, or host resistant, regulatory pest control, and chemical controls. That's basically uh, kind of summed up on that chart that we just seen in a couple slides ago. Now, here's pesticide resistance. Now, we talked about that just a few moments ago. Uh, we have a resistant individual here in the first box. Some individuals in a pest population have genetic traits that allow them to survive pesticide application. And basically, even when it comes to infectious disease, guys, you know, um, a virus is the one thing that could wipe out mankind overnight. You know, people worry about meteorites and gamma rays hitting the earth and stuff. I'm more worried about a virus, an infectious disease that could wipe us out overnight because we don't have enough time to figure out, one, what it is, and our smart scientists that are out there, they may not have enough time to, to, to do it. But even in the event like that, we're going to have some people that are just resistant to it, you know, a resistant individual. But here we're talking about applying a pesticide. You've got this one little critter who is resistant. A portion of the survivor's offspring inherit the resistant traits. So in box number two, at this next spraying, these resistant individuals will survive. And so we have three left. And then if pesticides are applied frequently, the pest population will soon consist mostly of resistant individuals. And then all the susceptible individuals will be killed off, except one or two maybe. And all of the offspring in the third box uh, has survived except that one. So pesticide resistance can spread quickly through a population that has several generations per year. Think about that house fly that we talked about, natural pest controls. An original pair of flies laying 600 eggs every six days. Crazy, isn't it? But slowing the spread of resistance is an important part of good pest management. Again, if we're having to use pesticide, guys, we need to change up. We need to change up how it affects uh, uh, the, uh, the pest and, and switching up the mode of action. So what is IPM? First, let's look at the three words separately. Integrated Pest 
management. Integrate, to combine two or more things. So again, guys, we still might be using pesticides in IPM, but it's not the only thing we're doing. We're doing at least two or even more things to form or create something. Pest, an animal or insect that causes problems for people, especially by damaging crops. Management, the act or skill of controlling and making decisions. I love the word management, and I would love to see us coin the term landscape management, landscape manager, instead of landscaping. I would prefer, like the name of our company, Elite Landscape Service. We're providing landscape services. Or if we were just doing property management, Elite Landscape Management. I don't like the names landscaping. Elite landscaping. I wouldn't want that. I want to be elite landscape management, elite landscape service, elite landscape construction. I love the term management. It makes you look professional. And it is professional because it is a skill of controlling and making decisions. You're, in a, you're a manager, a landscape manager, making these decisions within the IPM plan for your customer. IPM, initially developed for ag provides a process for identifying pest problems and designed to determine whether the cost of a particular pest management action is worth the result. Do you want to spend that money? Treatments are not made according to a predetermined schedule. Now, that contradicts loan care program, right? But again, guys, think about it. You have individuals that are mixing pesticides with their fertilizer. They've got one large tank on their truck. And they're going out and they're uh, spraying the entire lawn uh, for fertilizer. They're putting out a liquid fertilizer and they're adding the pesticide to it. Well, you don't need to do that. You're wasting money. Well, I'm saving money on labor. Trust me. But if you're spraying a 10,000 square foot lawn and fertilizing it and you're putting out a broadleaf herbicide mixed with the fertilizer and there's not a weed in the yard, look at the money that you've just lost by applying a pesticide where it's not needed. Second, it's against the law. You're only supposed to use it when needed. So keep everything separate. Again, you're using two practices. You're applying fertilizer, and you're only applying a pesticide when needed. So spot spraying, perfect. Treatments made when and where monitoring has been indicated that a pest will cause unacceptable conditions. Well, if your client's threshold is zero tolerance for weeds, spot spray it. Get rid of that pest. Get rid of that clover that's in the back right corner of the house. You didn't spray it over the entire lawn. Uh, unacceptable conditions. Economic damage, medical damage, aesthetic damage, and nuisance. Economic damage is damage directly affects the production of economic goods. Hey, and it hurts your pocketbook. A pest could wipe out an entire crop. That is economic damage. Medical damage, damage caused by passing of pathogens to humans and domestic animals. Again, we get sick. A virus, guys. Remember, like, the bird flu, avian flu, all that stuff that was happening, uh, you know, a few years ago, that scare in some of those movies. Uh, I love watching it uh, about, oh, Contagion, one of my favorite movies. You know, again, you know, the, the bird flu thing. So, guys, it can wipe us out. Aesthetic damage, presence of a plant or animal that causes undesirable change in appearance. Yeah, I, weeds kind of are ugly in turf grass, right? And they're definitely ugly within the shrub beds. And then nuisance, they're an annoying coexistence. They're not really causing any damage or anything. It's just, ugh, they're here. And so, economic damage, easily assessed in agriculture, forestry, and other related settings. And it could be assessed maybe on sod farms and stuff of that nature. But home, uh, home examples will be termites eating the wood, garden vegetables being lost, clothes moss, you know, tearing up your uh, your nice suits that's hanging in the closet, and then Dutch elm disease getting you know hurting hurting our elm trees. It's just good examples of what economic damage is. Now there on the right is termite damage. That is is a lot of trouble right there. You know, all that's got to be replaced. Now, look at the vegetable plant to the left. Is that necessarily a problem? Would you still eat that? Would you still put that in your salad? Well, I would. Because what does that tell me about that vegetable plant? 
Well, it tells me, for one, there hasn't been any pesticides applied to it. So what? An insect's ate part of it. I'm going to go inside and I'm going to wash the plant off anyway, but I know that there's not been any pesticides applied to this vegetable plant. So that's A-OK -okay in my book. Pathogens. Transmitted to humans and domestic animals by common wildlife. We have the bubonic plague, Lyme disease through ticks, uh, encephalitis. I can never say this word. I, I practice it 100 million times and I still cannot get it. Encephalitis, encephalitis, whatever, but malaria. Then his, histoplasmosis and taxoplasmosis. I can say those without a problem, but I, I, I just don't know about that. So uh, please laugh along with me, not at me, when it uh, comes to how my country accent um, says some of these words. But the bubonic plague. Again, you know, all about the flea uh, and, and the rats. And, you know, good, good picture here on the next slide of um, the rat carries the plague bacteria. Nasty old rat. The flea drinks the rat's blood. And then the bacteria multiply in the flea's abdomen. The flea bites a human. And then the human is affected. I couldn't imagine living back during this time of the bubonic plague. You know, we, we complain about problems that we have today, but, but guys, think about what our ancestors went through. And this is a horrible, horrible thing uh, to see, you know, entire family or your entire family killed off by disease like that. You know, and thank goodness for, for modern medicine today. Pathogens transmitted to humans and domestic animals by common wildlife, Lyme disease, you know, warning, ticks everywhere, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Pathogens transmitted to humans, common wallet, again, encephalitis and malaria. And the sad thing about it, how many people still die each year from malaria? It's crazy. It's crazy. We need to be out helping these third world nations with this. This is something that we shouldn't have. Um, luckily, I don't get bit by mosquitoes. Um, this was before, long before the blood thinners that I'm taking. Uh, but definitely don't think I've been bit since been on a blood thinner. But um, one time I was at the doctor and, you know, I told him, you know, I was like, I don't ever get bit by a mosquito. And um, I said, but I'm wondering if that has anything to do with iron in my blood. And he said it has everything to do with it because my watch batteries will not last. I have to replace a watch battery every six months or less because there's so much iron in my blood. And so he was like, the mosquitoes smell the iron. They don't want to they don't want to mess with you. So maybe. Maybe I can start selling my blood like some of these guys that let poisonous snakes bite them so they build up that um, anti-venom in their blood. But his histoplasmosis, internal fungus infection, you know, caused from people working in chicken farms their entire lives. Very, very dangerous stuff here, guys. And then taxoplasmosis, affliction of the central nervous system. A fetus may contract taxoplasmosis through placental connection with its infected mother. The mother may be infected by improper handling of cat litter or handling or ingesting contaminated meat. Now, I remember when uh, uh, the girl's mother was pregnant and I was on, at the time, active orders with Army or I was working uh, I was working a lot of times part-time at uh, Home Depot, and I, I would leave out at 7 o'clock in the morning, even when I was home, and not get back till 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. Well, my father-in-law would come over, you know, a couple times a week and change out the litter box when I was gone and stuff like that because um, the girl's mom was pregnant with, you know, at least one of them, and we always had a cat uh, uh, in the house at that time. And so that is very dangerous for pregnant women. Aesthetic damage. What constitute an undesirable change is highly personal. Again, some things don't bother me. It may bother you and vice versa. But social attitudes, nature is messy. People think that all the time. Nature is messy. You don't want it. But lack of understanding of the natural world is where they get these uh, opinions. And ornamental plants are susceptible to attitudes as well. A lot of people don't like certain plants that you may like and vice versa. And so here, appearance of the pest itself may cause fear and anxiety of people. Now, the spider here, guys, Mother Nature's number one pest control. And this looks like the spider that used to hang out um, by my gutter at the, uh, uh, the master bathroom. 
could look out the window and see him, and I would go out on the patio on warm summer nights, and I would see him just collect all these creatures that flew into his nest. He built the web right over top the spotlight. You could watch these flies and bugs just fly right into the nest, and he would come out there and wrap them up in his web, save them for later. And then we have the box elder bug. Now, this little guy is kind of cute by itself. Uh, red color and everything, but when you see this slide, when you see a million of them together, people freak out. Now, we have a golden rain tree on campus that every once in a while you'll see the box elder bugs just get all over the thing. They're not damaging it. This is one of those, I'd say, kind of coexistent things. They're, they're living there. They're not eating the tree. They're not doing any damage to it, but people see it, and students would walk by and scream. You'd hear young ladies scream when they saw all these bugs on it. They was afraid it was going to attack them or something, but they have nothing to do, no harm or whatsoever to the tree or even us. Um, here we have all these worms on the tree. Well, what do we need to do with that? Again, that's could cause major damage a little bit later. But guys, go ahead and cut the branch out. You know, it's just one of those things. Cut it out. Throw it on the fire pit. Those tent caterpillars, man, they can cause some some craziness going on in our minds when people see that. Now, here we have uh, we have some aphids. Aphids give live birth. Um, so they are clones of their mother since they are not fertilized by ma males. They can actually, I mean, the females can impregnate herself and, and reproduce, which is cool. And so aphids on maple trees, um, then we'll move on to roses and they'll damage all the blossoms. People fear, fear this, even though aphids only feed on plants in one or few closely related, um, genera. They're, they're not going to affect many things. They're actually, uh, um, you know, only going to attack, you know, they love maple trees. They love um, um, oak trees out in California, the Modesto ash trees, and, and the roses. But uh, uh, what's cool about these guys is, is that they only, they don't need a, they don't need a male to, um, to reproduce. But this aesthetic damage, guys, it's fear of future damage will cause the concern. Relief of the fear comes from learning the biology and ecology of the pest. Again, that's what we got Google for. GTS it. Google that stuff and you will find out. It'll teach us many things uh, about um, the ecology and biology of our pest. Um, sometimes the damage can be the product of the animal's activity. The problem can be solved by cleaning away the evidence, but leaving the animal alone. Um, again, don't kill the spider. If the spider web bothers you, then, then kind of move it. He's just going to come back and rebuild it again. But to me, that is absolutely gorgeous. I know that that is Mother Nature working. And look at that beautiful spider web. I love watching one of those bugs fly into it and that spider coming out at 100 miles an hour, tacking it, either biting it or just wrapping it up and spinning it and saving it uh, for lunch the next day. Um, uh, spiders will continue to catch houseflies and other insects even if you remove the web and just leave the spider alone. I mean, don't, don't damage it. The spider is Mother Nature's number one pest control, guys. The unsung hero other than peridosoids. So leave them be. Leave them be. Um, here, look at the honeydew that's dripping off on the uh, uh, sidewalk. And, and um, you know, is, is really a nuisance. There's really no harm other than if you did have a car parked underneath it. You know, you could slip on that. But, uh, you know, it, it is ugly to look at. Uh, you know, and basically we just need to clean it up, cut the branches out or something that are affected and dripping with the honeydew. Um, aphids can remain uh, and be food for predators that keep them under control. So, so don't, don't, don't worry these little bugs that are, that are causing all this. The fear on insects can make aesthetic damage a medical one, which is called um, ent entomophobia or entomology. You know, it's based off the word entomology, arachnophobia. You know, the, the fear of spiders, uh, but this fear can be overcame, just like with snakes, guys. 
Everybody's scared, scared of a snake. The, the one way to, to, to overcome that fear is to go and pick them up and start learning the biology of them and understanding what they exist. They exist to get rid of our mice. Hey, if you don't see any mice, that means you've got a black snake underneath your crawl space. Uh-oh. Well, guys, I'd rather have that, that black snake down there that's getting rid of my mice. He ain't going to come in the house. He don't want nothing to do with me. Plus, these dogs here in the house... He ain't going to let him in, but he's keeping those mice from coming in. Groups of animals or plants trying to coexist with humans are nuisance problems. We have the fungus gnats, sparrows, squirrels, invasive plants. They're going to be seedling trees or even exotics. And it's funny, uh, a lot of plants are getting invaded to the invasive exotic list. It's kind of crazy. I still like some of them, but... Uh, uh, the, the ones added to those lists are... are, are I guess a little different than, than myself. But no animal in itself is a pest. The way each of us feels about a visitor determines whether the animal is welcomed or not, whether it is a pet or a pest. Now, again, how can anybody not like this little creature here? His sole purpose in life is being at the bottom of the food chain. How would you like to live your life in fear of predatory birds, snakes, dogs, any of that nature. I'd rather, I'd rather get my neck broke by a rat trap than to be eaten alive. But anyway, um, it's all what we feel about the pest, guys. Again, we can all relate back to that Bermuda grass example that we started out with. Now, let's look at this example. In 1970, there was a case concerning the National Park Service, there was a golf course um, that had a bunch of residents who were being bitten by mosquitoes. So uh, the rich golf course residents didn't like the mosquitoes. They didn't want to go outside and drink their tea and get bit by mosquitoes. But the local farmers and lower income residents fished to supplement their diet. The fish were feeding on the mosquitoes. Well, the National Park Service came in and introduced Bacillus thuringiensis to kill the mosquito larvae. What happened to the fish? Well, the fish started dying off. Local farmers and lower income residents of this community that were part of the same ecosystem started not having food to eat, all because we killed off the mosquitoes. Just because a few residents got bitten by mosquitoes, National Park Service came in and introduced this Bacillus to kill them off, and then we had some people that were going hungry because of it. Again, we need to know the biology of the pest. The mosquitoes were there for a purpose, to feed the fish, which were feeding humans. Guys, it comes down to just educating ourselves, educating our clients. It is the human social context in which the organisms exist that determines whether a population is pestiferous. It is almost always the size of the population, not merely the presence of an individual organism that matters to humans. So we can tolerate one, but when we see a group of them, we start running. One little mouse may not be a problem, but we see 10 in the house in one day, well, that means that that snake might find its way through the front door as well, so we start freaking out. So, is the damage tolerable? A few fleas on the family dog? Hey, that's going to happen. You know, I probably could go over to my lab or my uh, German Shepherd right now, and I might find one. Might. Fleas in the carpet's a different story. I don't like that. you got to come in and get it fumigated. Well, these, these dogs go down to the pond and jump in it. They're going to get rid of that flea anyway. But think about a cockroach in the cabinet or a cockroach crawling on the floor. Now, if you have a fear of a cockroach, I need you to sit down. You may want to fast forward this a little bit because, guys, there is cockroaches in every single home out there. And I got some people saying, not in my house, not in my house. I clean my house. My house is not that dirty. It doesn't matter. Cockroaches need places to live. They look for dishwashers. They look for washer and dryers. They look for those dark corner places 
that has access to water. You got pipes that's going to sweat, so they got water. They have access to water. They like it where it's a little cool and damp. Uh, they're hiding. They don't want nothing to do with humans, and they definitely don't want nothing to do with each other. They're a solitary animal. So what happens when you see a cockroach crawling on the floor? That cockroach has been run off by one of its brothers or sisters. That means there's an infestation. A cockroach running across the kitchen floor in your home has been kicked out by the other ones because they like being by themselves. So that means he has nowhere else to go. That means every nook and cranny in your house is full of cockroaches if you see them. But don't worry. They're in every aspect of your home. You just know you got too many when you see one crawling across that kitchen floor. Now, I know if my mom was to hear that, she would take everything out of the kitchen sink, pull the dishwasher out. She would make sure that there was no cockroach. Total eradication, guys, is virtually impossible. You don't want that. It is undesirable. It kills the natural pest enemies. It can upset the broader ecological balance. However, it's warranted with newly invaded species. So, a virus is introduced. We want to get rid of it. If a new insect that could cause medical damage to humans, we want to get rid of it. We want to eradicate it in that situation. So, injury or damage level. Your toleration without harm to your health or plants of the presence of a pest or pest-related damage. It is a three-step process. How much aesthetic, medical, or economic damage can be tolerated? Again, that is totally up to you. Find out how large the pest population can grow before it causes that level of damage. And then third, treatment level to keep pest populations small enough not to cause damage. Again, your toleration or threshold is going to be different than your clients. You need to figure out what it is. Find out how large the pest population can grow. And then the treatment level to keep it small enough not to cause damage. And as we see this handsome fella here, and I am talking about Meow Meow, the cat, not myself. Uh, pictures taken several years ago. But Meow Meow was our family pet. Loved him to death. Miss him, miss him, miss him dearly. Uh, he was one of the first cats that I loved because I am a dog person. And even our labs uh, got along with him. He was just a good old, good old cat. But let's look at the example with him having fleas. If I comb him every day, and I did, I would get the brush out and I would comb him. The comb was a trap. I could check to see if there was a flea population. Did he have one? Did he have two? Or did he have several? I was able to do that with the comb. I was monitoring him. Was the flea population rising or falling? You know, once we treated him. I still combed him. Did I find a did I find a flea on him? If I did, yes, would monitor it. Didn't necessarily have to write it down, but I kind of kept a mental picture. Hey, he had a couple of you know fleas on him this week. So I was continuously monitoring Meow Meow. You need to be good at noticing things when you're monitoring. You need to be aware of your activities and how they affect other organisms, either pestiferous or desirable. And so with Meow Meow, he was an indoor outdoor cat. We declawed him when he was strictly inside, and the girl's mom wanted to take him to uh, to a shelter, and I'm like, no way. You know what's going to happen to him. He's still got his rear claws. Let's, let's let him be outside during the day and stuff. The dude absolutely loved it. He enjoyed his last few years hanging out outside, and but I would kind of monitor him. Where did he go? What fields did he go in? You know, we could see him, plus the dogs would always be with him. If they went out to the pasture and I combed him and he got more fleas, hey, I knew where they were kind of coming from. If he laid around on the patio all day and combed him at the end of the day, you know, he didn't have any fleas. You just got to be good at noticing things, guys, when you're watching things of that nature. So monitoring. There's levels of effort. There's hearsay. Uh, I kind of heard about it. Casual looking with no record keeping. Casual looking with written observation. Careful inspection with written observation, and then regular written observation and quantitative descriptions. And then we have quantitative sampling on a regular basis. And then seven, statistically validate or valid quantitative sampling. Match the level of monitoring effort to the importance of the problem. The most common and least helpful are levels one and two. Levels three, four, and five 
are the most helpful in the home and the garden. So levels three, four, and five are the most helpful. So go back and look at um, those three. And again, those, you know, that's when you start documenting things. You start monitoring it and recording the data. You know, level six and seven might be a little strenuous for us um, in the landscape field. So you'll usually start at level three, progress to level five, if you think the problems will become serious or recur. Level six is usually used in greenhouses when using beneficial insects. So release the ladybugs inside the greenhouse. Monitoring. You don't have to count numbers. You can use small, medium, and large infestation. You don't have to count 47 or 57. You can say small, medium, and large. Importantly, you must assess the situation at regular intervals. Make record of what you see, and it can be informal. What do you think one of the most valuable monitoring tools you can have is? Your eyes. Just get out there and see it. Being present. Going out and looking and watching. Why is this? The difference in hours of activity. You got to be there. Guys, you may have a pest problem that comes out at night and you don't even know what it is. Or you might misidentify what's going on. You may think... Um, there's this type of insect that's getting your vegetable plants during the day, whether, and, and it could be something totally happen at night that you're not paying any attention to. So you need to monitor it. You need to check it out different hours of the day, both morning, evening, and at night. The difference in hours of activity is one of the more common causes of misidentified pests. Like I said, you could have deer eat in your garden. It may not be that swarm of insects that you think is coming in during the day. Toolkit for monitoring. A maximum minimum thermometer may also be useful in addition to this monitoring cool uh, toolkit. Warm weather may spread the development of certain pest population. But inside this monitoring toolkit, uh, have A, an aspirator, B, uh, sticky traps and pheromone traps. C, plastic vials. Ziploc bags. D, hand trial. E, um, got a flashlight. F, because you're going to be doing it at night. You need a notepad and you need some pruning shears where you can take a sample or cut the branch out. See what it is that's happening. To know where to look for these pests, you must know something about its biology and ecology. And so I love some entomology classes, guys. But to find out more about its biology and ecology, you must know what the pest is. You've got to identify it. Misidentification is the number one reason that we fail as pest managers. So what should you look for? What comes first? Which comes first? Depends on what you know. If all you see is the pest damage and not the pest, try to answer these questions. Evidence of damage. What is it? Is there a presence of natural enemies? Are there relevant human activities that are going on that which may cause some of this, some of this damage? Is there other potentially contra, uh, contributing activities? And then what's the weather and microclimate, microclimate like? You know, again, think about the tomato hornworm example that we viewed in the uh, uh, natural pest controls lecture. Where and when to treat. In timing treatment activities, you often need to consider the life cycles and seasonal variations of both the pest and its natural enemies. With the flea example earlier, we know that fleas tend to be a problem a certain time of the year. Of course. Generation time may be shorter or longer than the seasons, and this has been a bearing on the treatment schedule. Bagworms before the bags. Beetles treated while grubs are in the lawn. Mosquito is larvae in the water source. You know, empty those water pans. You know, guys, they can't stress that enough from uh, the Department of Health. Correct timing is even more crucial in the application of the many newer, less toxic commercial pesticides, such as micro microbial controls and insect hormones. So, guys, we have to know when to treat it. We can't just go out and do it. You know, I had a question in one of my seminars last Saturday. They were talking about, um, you know, um, using snapshot 
in the uh, shrub beds as a pre-emergent weed control. They just said they haven't had any control. They hadn't had any luck with it. Well, they were putting it out the wrong time of year. Remember, you need to read the label on each and every pesticide that we put out. You know, a lot of this stuff is um, dependent on temperature, dependent on weather, dependent on the timing, the time of year that we put the stuff out. And then here are two of your uh, common names for the Bacillus th thuringiensis, a dipel and then caterpillar attack. Treatment should only be applied where the problem is most severe and have the greatest impact. Flea example. The fleas are in the bedding and the house, not just the pet. So tactics focusing on the animal are less effective in the long run. You're going to have to fumigate the entire house. But still, you got to monitor your pets. They're the ones going outside, getting these things, bringing them in. You need to leave a small, local, untreated residue of pests to feed the beneficial natural enemies of the pest. This works better like in greenhouses and stuff like that. If not, the natural enemies will leave since there is nothing to munch on. Now, spot treatment. Treating only the critical areas is known in IPM as spot treatment. Now again, I go back to that example when we're actually putting out... Um, Um, pesticides and liquid fertilized together and I see it so many times you see the chemical companies out mixing liquid fertilized with pesticide and I can understand you know doing a liquid pre-em with a liquid fertilized but not broadleaf herbicide because I see them spraying the entire lawn because they have to get the fertilize out but not the entire lawn needs the weed control actually only just a few areas need some spot treatments for the weeds. So guys do that. That's what being an IPM manager is all about. That's being a steward of the land. When you apply a pesticide in an area that doesn't need the pesticide, you're not a steward of the land. One, you're in violation of the law. It's against the label. So read the labels. Only spot treat if necessary. That's what being a good manager is. And this comes from Chapter 1 in Ornamental and Turfgrass Pest Management for North Carolina and Chapter 3 in the North Carolina Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Manual. And this core manual is used in many other states as well. Guys, I appreciate it. This is Turf Teacher, and uh, I will see you guys in the next lecture. Thank you.